All right, what's up guys? Today we're going to go in depth on how I built this, a Raspberry Pi power management system that allows me to turn off or on my Linux servers and always see whether or not they're on just by the look of an LED. All right, so in my previous video, I went over the overview of the project and why I did it. So I'm not gonna to be touching on that too much here. If you wanna see that, you can watch the previous video. However, what I am gonna be doing is my normal step-by-step -step tutorial on how to build something like this. So overall, the project's goal was to easily be able to turn off and on a server that uses a lot of power and always see whether or not it's on. This is because I like to buy a used power edge and I don't need it powered on all the time because it's mostly gonna be used for tinkering and when I need it, a high speed file server. And so I built this. Basically, this will always show me whether or not my server is on by lighting up the green light. Then the blue light flashes anytime a signal has successfully been sent, and the red light flashes if there was an error. Then the red button turns it off, and the blue button turns it on. Turning it on, I use what's called wake on LAN. Basically, there's a network port on my Synology that when the server powers off, it stays on and listens for a very specific packet. It's called a magic packet. If it hears that packet, it turns the entire server on. This is great because it means you can remotely power on your servers without having to walk down to wherever they're stored. The way I turn it off is an SSH command, sudo shutdown now, and I've got all the permissions required to send that command without actually sending a password, and I'll go into that in more detail soon. The green light is controlled by whether or not when I ping the server, if it comes back. If it comes back, the server's on and the light turns green. If it doesn't come back, that means the server's probably off and turns off. It's pretty simple overall. And this is all controlled by a single Python script that I wrote. And I'll either add it in the description or I might host it on another site just to make it easier for everybody to get access to. YouTube's kind of weird, I know. If you've got the greater than or the less than sign, it does not allow those in the description for some reason. I'm not really sure why. So I'll go ahead and start off right here with the physical build of the thing. And it's really simple. Basically, I have three LEDs and two buttons hooked up, every single one of them with their negative terminals tied to the ground pin on the breadboard using a 100 ohm resistor. Whenever you're building simple electronics with a Raspberry Pi using buttons and LEDs, you always want to make sure to add in at least a 100 ohm resistor into the circuit. For the buttons, this ensures that you don't create a short circuit every time you click the button, so it will help not damage your Pi. Then for the LEDs, LEDs have a very low internal resistance, and so if you power them with 5 volts with no resistor on them, they will burn out really easily, and they'll be incredibly bright. So you just throw a 100 ohm resistor on there to keep everything from drawing too much power and burning out the LEDs or damaging your Pi. Then on the negative terminal of the breadboard, I've got it tied to the negative terminal of the Raspberry Pi. This way they have a common ground. Then on the positive terminals of all the buttons and LEDs, I've got each of them tied into a different GPIO pin on the Raspberry Pi. This way I can control the power going to the LEDs and sense if a button's been clicked. Overall, this is a really simple build. I actually just got a super cheap electronics kit from Amazon and it probably cost about 15, 20 bucks and it came with a breadboard, buttons, LEDs, and just about everything you could need for a pretty simple project like this. I would always recommend having one of these kits lying around because it's fun to do. All right, so now that you've got the hardware set up for the Raspberry Pi, the next step is gonna to be to set up Wake on LAN for whatever server you're gonna be doing this on. I'm gonna be demoing this on a Synology. However, every different type of server is gonna have a different way to set up Wake on LAN. All you're going to need is Wake on LAN enabled and the MAC address of whatever network interface you're gonna be using for Wake on LAN. All right, so if you're doing this on Synology, the first thing you're gonna go ahead and do is log into DSM. Then we're going to go into control panel, hardware and power, and enable Wake on LAN on all of the network interfaces you would like to be using. If you've got a bond, make sure to turn Wake on LAN on for every single one of those network interfaces. Then we're gonna go back to the home and we're gonna find out what the MAC address of our network interface is by going into Info Center, 
network, and then down to the MAC address of whatever network interface you're going to be using. So I've got this blurred out, but it should be six groups of letters and numbers in pairs separated by dashes. And so that is the MAC address of the network interface that we're going to be sending the wake on LAN packet to. That way our wake on LAN server will know where to send the packet. All right, and so now we have everything we need to set up wake on LAN on our Raspberry Pi. So we're going to go ahead and SSH into the Raspberry Pi. And so if you don't know how to do this, I've got a few tutorials on this already that I'll link in the description. I'm on a Mac, so I'm just going to SSH using terminal. However, if you're using PC, you're going to have to use PuTTY or another SSH client. And if you're using Linux, you know what you're doing already. All right, so I've just SSH'd into my Raspberry Pi. And the first thing we're gonna to need to do is set up EtherWake. This is what we're gonna be using to send the magic packet to say, wake up to our server. So this is an app, so we're gonna be using git app. So whenever you're using git app for the first time in a day, it's always recommended that you do a sudo app git update to update the location of packages on the internet. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is actually use app git to install etherwake. So we're gonna do sudo apt git install etherwake. And as you can see on your screen there, I typoed it the first two times and had to reshoot this section. All right, and so now etherwake should be installed on a Raspberry Pi. So I'll just give us some room here. All right, and so now, just to show you how etherwake works, we're gonna do sudo etherwake dash i, that way we can specify the network interface, WLAN zero, because I'm using the wired Raspberry Pi ethernet connection. Then all you have to do is type in the MAC address with colon separation of the network interface you would like to send the magic packet to. So I'm just gonna make something up here. This is where you would put your actual MAC address and just hit enter. And so it's just sent that wake on LAN command to 11223344556, which is not a real MAC address, but wake on LAN does not know that. Because of the way networking works, it's never gonna get a response. So it's actually not gonna know whether or not the server ever gets it. But if you did this with your real MAC address, your server should be turning on now. Note, servers generally take a little while to boot up, but within the next couple of minutes, it should be on. All right, and so now we've got the power to turn on our server from our Raspberry Pi. And so the next step is just gonna to be to turn it off. All right, and so now we're going to have to set up SSH keys on our Raspberry Pi. This way, the Raspberry Pi will be able to log in to whatever server we're talking to without having to send a password. This way we can have the Raspberry Pi send the signal whenever we press a button without having to authenticate the SSH session using our password. Instead, the Raspberry Pi will send an authenticated packet based off of your private key stored on your Raspberry Pi and the public key pushed onto the server. Basically, when you're SSHing into your server, the very first thing your Raspberry Pi is gonna check is whether or not there's a private SSH key used for this server. It's then going to do some very special math and send the result of that math over to your server. The server is then going to take the result of that math and check it against the public keys that it's got stored for the user. If the math works out with the public key, that means that the public key and the private key are synced and therefore the user has the proper authentication and it will allow you to SSH in without typing a password. I would actually recommend setting this up with everything you SSH into on a regular basis because it's so nice not having to type in a password every time. So if you've not set up an SSH key before, it's really simple. All you have to do is do SSH dash keygen and it's going to do all of the settings for you. Just hit enter and it's crucial that you leave the passphrase blank because if you type in a passphrase here, then you would have to type in that passphrase to send the SSH key, which defeats the purpose for what we're doing. All right, and right here, this is the pretty art of the SSH key. So now there is a public and a private key on my Raspberry Pi. 
and I need to get that public key into my Synology. I've already done a more in-depth tutorial on the Synology that I'll post here because there are a few settings you've got to tweak. Every server is also going to be different for this, but most of them are very straightforward and will work with SSH keys out of the box. But if you're doing Synology, go ahead and check out the link in the description. So now to copy over the SSH key, all we have to do is SSH copy ID and type in the SSH credentials of the server you would like to use SSH authentication with. All right, and so now we've sent over the SSH key. So let's test it out by just doing trying SSH. And as you can see here, I did not have to type in my password. This is because instead of a password, it sent over my SSH key. So we know that it worked. So I'll just exit out of that. And now I'm back on my Raspberry Pi and hit clear. All right, and so now we've got it set up where we can automatically log in to our server from our Raspberry Pi without sending a password. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so now I'm in my server and the command we're gonna be sending is a shutdown now. So if we try to type this right now, it's gonna say error, you need root access. And that's the whole problem because you would have, you have to type sudo shutdown now and it will ask for your password. But we don't want to have to enter a password every time. And so to get around this, we're going to be editing the sudoers file. All right, so this is my disclaimer. Be very careful when editing the sudoers file. This is because the sudoers file is how you authenticate as root. I actually nearly locked myself out of my Synology when I was doing this the very first time. Luckily, there is a way to log in as root through DSM that I'll be making a video on next time, but it's something you need to be very careful with. It's a very core part of your system. And so when we're doing this, I'm going to go ahead and make myself root doing sudo soup. All right. And so now I've elevated myself from a user to the root. This means I can edit the file. And if something does break, I'll still have root access to be able to test it. All right. And so now that we're root, we're going to edit the sudoers file, which is in etc sudoers. All right, and so right here, I'm gonna type I to insert, and then add the line, your username, all equals no password, password WD, colon, slash sbin, slash shutdown. So what this does is it says for space rucks, He's allowed to use the shutdown command without entering a password. This basically limits the root access to the user space rex to only having root access to shutdown, meaning I won't have to enter a password to do this, but it also means that an automated system does not have root access to my entire Synology, which is just a recipe for disaster. And so now we're going to hit escape colon WQ exclamation point and hit enter. And so now, as you can see, we're still root. So we're going to go ahead and create a new SSH session. And we're going to have a separate login to our Synology using whatever user you're going to be SSHing in with. And the reason I had to enter a password there was I was SSHing from my local Mac to the Synology and not the Raspberry Pi to the Synology. And so now in the separate tab, we're going to try the command sudo shutdown dash p now. And as you can see here, that command worked without having to enter a password. This means that our Raspberry Pi will be able to send that command over SSH and not have to type in a password. And it also means that everything went correctly and we did not break the sudoers file. And so the other login as root is not necessary. That is something you're going to use in case you do typo and mess up your system. You can go back to that tab and use root access to fix whatever you broke. 
It's basically a backup in case you do make a mistake. Though if it does break, there is still a way to fix it on a Synology using Control Panel. It has an automation section where you can type in code and run it as root, which is actually what I had to do to fix this when I broke it the first time. I basically typed in the command to give that file access to everyone and ran that as root. And so then I was able to log in as a regular user, fix it, and then revert the changes once it worked. All right, and so now we've got the functionality for both shut down and boot up built into our Raspberry Pi, and they can both be executed with a single command without having to type a password. All right, and so that means we can now run the Python script that I wrote to control all of this. And I'll go through it here. So this right here is the script that I wrote, and it's actually pretty simple. I'm using Atom for the text editor. I know a lot of people ask these questions and I love it. And so I'll just go over a pretty brief overview of the code and kind of what it does. And so this first section right here is where we're importing all of the Python modules that we're gonna be using. So import OS allows us to use os.system to send commands as if they were typed into the terminal, which is what we're gonna be doing a lot here. Then we're gonna be using both LED and button options from GPIO zero. So that's actually a custom Raspberry Pi module that allows you to control the GPIO pins and it actually runs really well. So then I've got a bunch of regular declares here. The server IP address I use to ping the server every few seconds to tell whether or not it's on. That is what controls whether or not my green status light turns on or not. Then I've got the MAC address of the network interface here. That way it's not hard coded down below. And so you can just update that with whatever system you're using. The server username, that's what you're gonna be logging in with. All right, and then right here, I've got the blinking commands for basically how long to turn on the lights and stuff. Then this section right here is where we define what GPIO pins are tied to which things. For each of the LEDs, they're called out by LED with a parentheses and number. That number is the number of the GPIO pin based off of this graphic right here that is tied to the positive terminal of the LED. The same thing goes for the two buttons, except the command is buttons instead of LED. The buttons have a great added capability. Basically, you can set up a command to be executed every single time the button is pressed. This way, if you click the button in, it executes a command without having to do something in a loop or anything like that. Overall, that's the big changes within the server. And so right here, I'm just predefining my timestamps in the past. And then right here, we get to our three core functions. Server ping, which tells whether or not the server's on or not. Wake up, which sends the wake on land command. And shut down, which sends the shutdown command. Server ping is very simple. Basically, it uses this os.system to send a system command. In this case, we're using ping. Then we're sending this ping-c1 to whatever IP address we've set up. The dash c1 is for count. All we need to do is send a single ping. Then the way this works is if it successfully gets a ping back, that means the server's on and the ping status will be set to zero. So we'll turn the LED on. If it sends any other number back, it means the server's off, and so that means the LED should be off. It's very simple. And that's all it is to tell whether or not the server's on. And I've just got that in a constant loop happening every few seconds. Then the wake up command is executed every single time the wake up button is pressed. And all it does here is check first to make sure that a button has not been pressed really recently. I just did this to make sure that if you hit a button twice in a row real quick, it doesn't send a command twice and cause issues. And then it just sends the either weight command to whatever MAC address you've got set up in the variables above. And it has the exact same return system, though Etherwake will very rarely send a fail command because it doesn't know whether or not the server actually got the wake on land command. And finally, we've got the shutdown function. And here, the core function is once again a os.system send. This sends an SSH command 
using the server user at the IP address. And what it sends is a sudo shutdown dash p now. That way, this command gets executed over a single SSH session and then closes that session. It's a really easy way of doing it. And once again, has the same working lights. All right, and so overall, that's the main parts of my code here. You can read the rest of it if you'd like more information, but overall, it works pretty well. So now we have to go about getting it on our Raspberry Pi. And so if you're using a Windows machine, you're gonna to need to use something like FileZilla to transfer it over. But if you're using a Mac or a Linux machine, you can transfer it natively. So just go back into your terminal and we're gonna to go to whatever folder the command is saved in. And as we can see right here, I've got this wakeonland.py that I created. And that's that code we saw earlier. All right, and so now to transfer over this file, we're gonna do a secure copy using SCP, which actually copies a file over SSH. So we're gonna do SCP, the location of the file, and then the location where it's going. And so right here, it's just wake on land. And then where it's going is over SSH. So we're gonna use the SSH login. And then we're going to do colon, and then wherever you'd like to save it. And whenever you do this, it's relative to your user's home folder. So I just wanna save it there. So I'm gonna do dot period. And so as we can see here, it's successfully transferred. And since I did the colon period, it will just save directly in the home folder. So we'll SSH in. All right. And so once we've got this code, all we have to do is say Python, wakeonland.py and it's going to run that code back to back to back and as we can see here my server is on so it's successfully saying that the server is on and so the light is green and so that means it's working but now we want to have this set up to run as soon as the raspberry pi gets turned on all right so to get this script to run every time a raspberry pi reboots we're going to use crontab so we're just do crontab dash e and we're just going to go to the bottom here. We're going to say at reboot to specify every time the Raspberry Pi reboots to execute this command. The command is Python because it's a Python script and the location of the file. So I'm going to be using a direct path because it's less likely to mess up. And that's home pi slash wake on land dot py. So now we're just going to edit it. And let's see what happens when we do a sudo reboot. All right, and so now that we've rebooted, we can see right here that the lights are in fact working and therefore the script is running. To kill it, you've got to figure out what the task name is by using ps aux. This shows you all the processes going on. And so we're going to go to the top and scroll down until we see the command starting with Python, which is right here. And so that means the command's ID is 418. And so to stop it, we're going to do a sudo kill 418. And so we've stopped it. But the next time we reboot it, it's going to start right back up again. All right. Well, that's it for this tutorial. I hope everybody found this interesting. It was a fun project for me to make, and maybe it will even save the planet a little bit. All right. Well, have a good one. Bye.